This episode, I'm joined once again by Matt Cahoon, who recently edited the text Post-Capitalist Desire, Mark Fisher, The Final Lectures. In this episode, we discuss the text alongside discussions on acid communism and the world of post-work. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Okay, uh, Matt Cahoon. Uh, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics podcast. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Um, it's very nice to be back, actually. I think it's been a while since we did, I remember when we first spoke. It feels like a long time ago. So it's very nice to, yeah, come yeah. back and catch up. So, so the, yeah, the first you were the first episode back in uh, early 2018. And then we did that short one promoting the course in, I don't know, August or something? I don't know. Yeah, um, we're in the midst of the, the emptiness that is the pandemic. Yeah, still all existing in this drifting, Balladian nightmare. Um, but you're coming on to talk about uh, the the book that you've just edited, Post Capitalist Desire: The Final Lectures, which is Mark Fisher's sort of final lectures, uh, which he delivered at um, Goldsmiths University. So this would have been late 2016. Yeah, I think it was around, um, I think, yeah, I think from November to December. So the, five, the the last five weeks of term before Christmas. Okay, okay. And then obviously these lectures, for those who don't know Mark's uh, Fisher's biography, these lectures were, I think it only gets to the third lecture or is it the fourth? Fifth. Fifth, there's, oh, there's sorry, five, sorry. Yeah. Fifth out of 12. Fifteen. Fifteen, wow. So yeah. then there's, the, there's basically just the reading for the final ten uh, and obviously Mark then sadly uh, passes away. And sort of this is, there was K-Punk, which was the compilation of sort of everything which hadn't been officially published from the K-Punk blog. So this really is now like, you know, probably some of the last stuff we have of, of Fishes, which is around. So how did this sort of come about? I mean, I know that you were, you went to these lectures um, and you said to me that these were then compiled from notes and recordings that people had taken yeah so the lectures were recorded by um <clears throat> another one of mark's students called uh, natsay zavril um and uh uh yeah i think just for note taking um uh just yeah i, I mean no yeah no, not for any sort of sense of posterity it was just i guess when you have a, a any sort of lecture i think listening back to things is often <laughs> more useful than not and so they'd just been uh they, they were kind of shoddy recordings like i don't have to kind of piss on them but i mean they, you know they, they weren't for publishing um they were just for note taking and uh but yeah um they were those recordings were sort of doing the rounds pretty soon after mark died um and it was listening back to them myself that kind of set me off on kind of my own interest in following what mark was doing at that time um but I think that how these lectures came about specifically is more that um, over the years since Marcus died, a lot has been said about what he was doing towards the end, his sort of acid communism stuff, um, the the sort of final, well, the introduction, I should say, to, to what acid communism that was going to be Mark's next book was sort of published at the end of the K-Punk collection. Um, and that was sort of assumed to be all that there was. Um, and a lot of people had sort of run with that introduction as a, uh, you know, as some sort of like, like pre-Socratic fragment or something. Um, but I think for me personally, the, I got the sense that there's actually a lot more out there that explains what Mark was interested in and what he was doing than I think a lot of people were aware of. So the reason for really putting this together um, is not so much to kind of, I guess it's easy to be cynical about really, that he, uh, but the, the, that the intention was never to eke out what was left of Mark's writing, but really just to clarify that last point in his life that had, has been such a massive talking point, um, but with sort of very little, so much speculation around it really. And hopefully that these these sort of final five lectures, they don't really tie it up in any truly, you know, um, holistic sense. They at least hopefully provide some further structure to and background to what Mark was really interested in and in looking at at that time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one thing yeah one thing you know you said about the the shoddy recording one thing i actually loved about the book was um <clears throat> it's edited in such a way that it, they you know you, it would have been easy to tamper with these lectures and not actually remove you know the whole the point of what is mark saying 
um, but still retain, you know, the coherence. But actually, a lot is left in, which which makes you realize that these were because um, it just reminded reading through it just in terms of form, it reminded me completely of my university experience. You know, lecture, <laughs> yeah. lecturers calling on people to do things, and there is just like silence, and then an awkward sort of two people like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. And then also, you know, left in that the people admitting, you know, it's nice to see Mark saying. Well, I haven't actually read the um, the critique of dialectical reason by Sartre, or people saying actually I just really didn't understand this. Um, so there's something refreshing in that unfinished, like you know, philosophy books do this thing where the way they're written is like, you know, X and Y says this in their book, like okay, we oh we all understand, we've all read that, we all understand that, and that is definitely you know. So there's a sort of unfinished immediately we're not completely accepting everything we're also being humble enough to say like yeah, okay this, you know this is complex stuff um so and also one thing i was going to say you just reminded me of the acid acid communism thing i think there's been a unfortunately i think there's been a subreddit made for acid <laughs> communism so and i surprised me yeah so i don't know <laughs> like i don't know if you want to venture there or because i think some stuff came someone sent me something about like mental exit and acid communism and it was a reddit link and i was like oh dear this is i mean that's yeah that's partly it. i'm i'm sort of i'm i'm vaguely aware of that stuff and i feel like uh, over the past few years i've been i feel like i've openly been quite cynical about a lot of it um that there is just this sense of like let's just let's just be hippies again for the the, the 21st century hippies and like that's just it's just <laughs> i feel i always feel like i'm just being the cunt that's like <laughs> pissing on people's parades but it's just not what mark was interested in and it's like if that's what you're interested in that's fine but like if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about mark's legacy and what he was working on and um you know let's do it properly <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's almost like the same trajectory as accelerationism where people are like yeah man we're gonna burn down society um <laughs> that's not you know you don't want to be that person who completely gatekeeps and like draws a line and wants you know but there is a point where you have to say that's just not that like, if you want to do that, yeah. I really have no problem, but call that, you know, do your own thing, but don't sort of subsume something that you find interesting in, in uh, you know, an aesthetic, like, you know, yeah, because, you know, as, it, as you say, acid communism was trying to do some fairly in-depth stuff. But I mean, getting, well, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I, was, I mean, I just, I guess that's it just to say that that's kind of, that is sort of the point. I think there's, it, there's a very fine balance between saying this is not, like, th that is not this, <laughs> but also like, Kind of emphasizing the point that it, it, it's not to it's not to shut anything down, but rather to say that there are genuinely unresolved questions here, and they're kind of more interesting than whatever this sort of surface level like tie dye philosophy thing is. Like it's 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 actually more interesting than that, and I think that you will agree if we kind of like let's talk about it. So I guess that's kind of why I'm actually probably it's probably better just to do this book because rather than just be the person that's like no. Well, you know, let's just let's let's put the actual unfinished thing out there and be like, no, let's let's. What are these? What are the questions that are here that we're not talking about and probably should do? Yeah, what do we actually have that is directly, you know, does this term has come up? What have we actually got that was, and you know, where did it initially come from? Instead of just, I think it's a thing where it's it's almost like accelerationism though, in that very flimsy way of like, it's a super cool name, accelerationism, <laughs> acid communism. It sounds cool, you know. It's like Deleuze. People love Deleuze. Because he has a Z in his name. And that's my, you know, that's the big theory. It sounds so, <laughs> yeah. Gilles Deleuze sounds so edgy, so cool. But then it's like the name versus the reality of reading difference re and repetition. It's like the name, you know, of acid communism. Like, oh man, this is going to be like the most awesome, you know, exciting, bleeding edge of theory. And sometimes when you get into it, it's like, well, no, you're still going to need to. It's like, yeah, man, acid communism. What do you think of Marx's labor theory of value or whatever, right? <laughs> But you know, that still has to be dealt no, with. No, it's totally it. But I think that's it. I kind of think that's the point. Like, it's intentional. The intention is, it, it is it is literally the hook. But it's like saying, well, okay, now we've got you hooked. <laughs> let's get to the shit. Let's not just stay with the hook. Like, let's, let's follow the line down and see what's on the end of that rod. That's not just, yeah, that the pointy, shiny end. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so then I guess then I would say, what, what is acid communism? Because that's the, that's the underlying abstract thing well maybe not so abstract thing which which is you know the foundation in a way of post-capitalist desire um yeah um i suppose that i mean there's so many different ways of unpacking it which is partly what's so interesting that um i think that 
what, what interests me about it is really that you can if you if you cut that phrase in half and you talk about what's acid and what's communism both of those terms are probably as this this they're as disagreeable as each other and what is communism in the 21st century is already a massive question what do you what happens when you put something like acid on the end does you know are we talking about like acid house so we talking about like music genres are we talking about acid as in psychedelia are we talking about acid as in just like corrosive like chemical horridness um and i kind of feel like the the, the, the idea is kind of all of the above and sort of similar with communism like what is communism in the 21st century well all of the above like how do we deal with the whole thing in its kind of mess um because i think that that's sort of um that is the challenge for the, the left in general in the 21st century in a lot of ways like how do we deal with our own history how do we deal with where it's going where it's been um that the, the, where it's been is arguably in a lot of ways not very attractive um uh, uh and and there's lots of problems there but you know it's well I guess it's a it's a it's a case of just trying to really wrestle with those things and um, ask those big questions in a way. But I guess, yeah, at the same time, like make them sexy. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess it's 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 maybe a slight cop out because I don't think there is an answer. I don't think we really know what acid communism is. But um, I feel like that the questions that are sort of wrapped up in that question in itself kind of. Um, are some of the key ones I think Mark wanted the left to be asking itself. Um, yeah, regarding, I guess, um, I mean, all the, yeah, all the associations with acid, when we're talking about hippie movement, the counterculture of the 1960s, uh, rave culture, industrial horridness, mixing all that together, um, and sort of thinking what the legacy of that is and how that kind of, yeah, what, 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 what is likewise the legacy of, of, of communism? How do, how do those movements, counterculture, rave culture, industrial, industrial, post-industrial, whatever, ism, I don't want to say ism, but I guess it's, we can call it that, industrialization or whatever, um, how do they all make, how do they all, how are they all connected? Um, how do we talk about that rather than just like Soviet aesthetics? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting you mentioned the history thing, because it's something you, you said before that, you know, the the right is really critical of their their history, um, and they're they're usually fairly, almost pessimistic of like when they've messed up or you know in terms of their aims or at least they're you know they're very critical of themselves and they have their finger on sort of what's going wrong within whatever they deem a movement. And and Fisher seems to be one of the first leftists to sort of say we probably need to take a bit of this and you know uh, extinct vampire castle and with capitalist realism is this underlying sort of acceptance that okay you know there's this melancholy here we need to sort of address it instead of this just constant push i mean i don't know if you'd agree with that but did you think that um acid communism is then heading further in that direction of of dealing with that um understanding of your own history as a movement um yeah but in, in, i guess kind of in the in the other way i think one of the things that mark was most conscious of was what he called left melancholia which is you know there's, there's, that in itself has a history walter benjamin talks about left melancholia in the, what, the, the the 20s and 30s wendy brown who's a big reference for him talks about the left melancholia in the 80s and 90s and mark's kind of doing the same thing that but but sort of talking about how it's not just it's not just an, uh, this sort of uh it's not just being self-critical but actually being pessimistic um and kind of call, you know, calling it a pathology of the left, if anything, that um, the left adopts um, its own, you know, it, take, it, it takes on all too readily its own sort of underdog um, uh, identity. Like it always sees itself as being below. Um, but to the extent that when it, if it gets the chance to being in power or having success, doesn't know what to do with it. Um, and that's the analysis that you can, I mean, you can even trace it back to Nietzsche. Nietzsche talking about resentiment. Um, that's what you think Mark mentions in the lectures. Um, so I guess that in a way it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sort of, it's a sense of being self-critical and being aware of one's own history, um, but being confident about fixing it. Um, so I think there's a few like late K-punk persons who Mark's talking about, like not just the politics of joy, but of confidence, like we, we've got, or not hope, but confidence. Like you can say part of the whole problem with the Obama era was that whole hope thing mm -hmm. um, being, be, uh, and, and I guess that it's, you know, hope, what, hope's not enough. You've got to be, you've got to be confident in what you're doing if you want to actually change things. 
um, because hope's just hope, like hope in itself is kind of like it's like a backwards insult to yourself. Yeah. Like you know things are shit, but this will hopefully get better. But they're still shit. Where it's like no, we're confident that we can do this, and that's kind of I think what Mark was pushing for in a way. Um, yeah, based on I guess that's just communism being nothing. Like there have been strengths. The counterculture had a lot of strengths. The rave culture had a lot of strengths. I know they've died. What can we kind of? How can we better understand that history and carry some of the best bits of it forwards? The things that weren't tried or weren't really given the time of day that could could, could probably are probably you know arguably. Um, I think this is a point that Mark makes, and I think even people like Aaron Bastani have made it a few times that like um, you know we can say that the left tried things and it didn't work. Maybe because they are actually a bit too ahead of their time, and some things, if, if the left tried them again, they would be far more likely to be successful than they were at the time when they, you know, were first sort of radical suggestions. That there wasn't the, you know, there wasn't the technological infrastructure, or we weren't connected in the right way um, to actually make that kind of mass movement happen. So that's obviously it died. Now there's probably a better chance of that happening. That kind of thinking, I think, is kind of what Mark's talking about, um, and how, yeah, connecting. The, the, the what's something like acid communism that stinks of 60s counterculture and bringing it forwards yeah i mean that that actually does connect directly with that that first question i sent you which is you know that that fisher does early on he mentions this the the sort of um cultural culturally emotional effects of drugs in terms of you know those movements that you were just speaking about you know i guess you'd say the counterculture generations the hippies that you know uh, what was it turn on tune in drop out acid generations yeah. that whole idea of acid of of this these entire generations of of the 60s maybe through to the mid 70s that you that were trying to uh emancipate themselves sort of psychologically and expanding consciousness and of course many i mean frank frank um frank zappa is like the clear example of someone who saw even at the time actually all of these people have ended up in their in the the place they completely said they didn't want to Right, they all ended up in sort of the ivory towers and actually that whole movement ended up doing the opposite of what it wanted for really strange reasons so that you know all these people were all the, especially the hippies i mean i it's probably personal bias that i just but there was some such little substance in that movement other than that aesthetic but there wasn't a potential there but that you know flower power and and this this anti-authoritarian attitude but it ended up in those that exact generation adoring you know 401ks and retirement funds and nine to five office jobs and yet they loved it you know they and they all love it now um and i guess the the sort of mediation between the two and how one transformed into the other is really you know what what can we take of that before state to make it not end up in that acceptance you know because yeah. there's something in there which has sort of maliciously taught that that attitude that hopeful attitude Oh, actually, no. You know, you do want uh, a nine-to-five office job. Do you, you know? Do you think that's where Fish is coming from with his his sort of um, abstract reference to drug culture? Yeah, Mark hated hippies so much. <laughs> Despite, at least, especially in early like K-pop blog posts, he's really, really scathing um, for the same reasons that you mentioned, and 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 also kind of beyond that, like there's um there's a post he has called psychedelic fascism. Um, where he kind of talks about this, um, that kind of the, the sort of free love aspect of the hippie movement, where it's as if it's giving in to some sort of primal inner child. Um, and Mark sort of says, no, like your inner child is like your inner fascist. Like that, that's, it's not, that's not something to base a movement off of. It's like, of like just being like, like, I mean, it, it always makes me think of like weird baby fetish, like men that you see online, like wearing diapers, like fully giving into that, like um, uh, it kind of leaves you, you know, you want to be, you then you want to be babies, right? You're, you're welcoming in like a totalitarian sort of regime almost of like the, the super mother to come in, like change your nappy. And it's like, that's, I don't know, I mean, that's probably, I'm, I'm running with this a bit probably far beyond <laughs> what Mark was talking about. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's kind of the association that it brings to mind for me anyway. That probably mm -hmm. says more about me than him. Um, but anyway, um, but I guess the question, because I guess why Mark hated hippies is because he wasn't of that generation. You know, he was he, he was a post-punk. But I guess what is interesting maybe for him later on, which I find interesting personally too, is that um, I guess it's, you know, when you talk about something like post-punk, um, it's kind of already got a lineage. I mean, because it's it's sort of in the post. It's like the um, the, the sort of timeline as he uh, talked about often, where you know, punk is this great refusal, this 
sort of great swelling of negativity um, that kind of creates this void, this cultural void where anything can happen. And the post-punk movement that comes out of that, which is especially for Mark that he carries forwards, is that, um, I think this is something that Mark says explicitly, you know, he says like, his the post-punk maneuver for him is to turn punk's nothing into something. Mm-hmm. Um, as if to say, this great voiding, this great negativity, which also ends up kind of in similar places, right? I mean, you can talk about hippies in 401k, you can talk about Johnny Rotten advertising like butter and insurance policies on TV. And it's like, you know, that's what happens when you stick in a moment. So mm-hmm. I think the thing for Mark is then, well, you know, what, what, what does that tearing up of things make possible? And then how can we keep that going? You know, how can we keep, you know, rip it up and start again? And I guess what maybe it becomes interesting for Mark is that, you know, hippie is, uh, the hip counterculture is its own version of that in a way. It's like, you know, it's not, about, it's less about what was hippiedom and what did it lead to, but rather why did it emerge in the first place? Mm. And that's probably, I think, is what's more interesting for him. And what he kind of initially explores in the lectures, you know, he's not necessarily talking about, I mean, he talks about the 70s, more about the sort of the end of that moment when hippie turns into punk and, and sort of the, all the political strife of that decade. But he kind of skips over the 60s entirely and talks more about the 50s, mm-hmm. like Herbert Marcuse and, and that kind of moment and why the, why the 50s kind of, there was that percolation maybe after the, the, the two world wars, you know, kind of trying to articulate what, what changed, what was the sort of fertile ground that this counterculture managed to emerge from. Um, and why have those kind of kind of stopped emerging? I guess that's also part of the question that he wants to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, what 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 is there to be rip? What is there to rip up now? How can we rip it up? What is there to you know? How do we turn the soil? If, if I'm sending too much time on the allotment, I'm trying to avoid gardening metaphors, but that's kind of what it feels like, right? It's how do you take a how do you take a shovel to this and just like turn it over and allow new growth? And I think that's kind of where we've long been at. That's the question for accelerationism. Um, and I guess Mark's asking that same question, you know, where did that go? Well, to answer that, let's go back to the 50s and the 70s and, and sort of look at that, that main big sort of mid swathe of cultural, culturally generative period that was sort of in the middle of the 20th century. Yeah, I mean, the, 50, the 50s is the odd, the, the real strange generation, right? That's the, what's well, just the ignored, they technically are the lost generation, aren't they? Or is it, um, no, that's something else. But I know that's to do with the war. I can't remember who the lost generation is. I'm not sure either. Actually. I'm gonna have to look it I've up. I've heard that. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that. I've heard that said probably about a few generations. You say lost generation, I just think about like Zoomers and the COVID. Oh no, they were the ones so that came after World War One. Okay, okay, right, okay. But yeah. I mean, like you said, well, uh, no, that sort of though, still right? works, right? Because you're yeah. you're so um, you're so just engulfed in this sort of uh, complete abortion of human life that any very niche ideas of oh you know what it what it means to be your generation are just completely obliterated so you know there is something there but th- that's a strange one because there's 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 so many things combining in that moment that it's it's weird right because you have the industrialization which is initially used for the war for world war Two. you know the difference between world war one and two is that what ernst Jung and talks about that total mobilization of just complete industrialized hell and the difference between the two is is just in terms of technology, insane. But then I guess it's not. No one other than people like Paul Virilio see that that technology that came from that is then used. But actually, it's not. It seems to be used in a positive sense, you know. So what I'm what I'm trying to say here is, you know, that it seems that that first post World War Two generation are the ones that got subsumed into this new anomaly of capitalism, where it's finally amazing, and it probably can, you know, it can be amazing. But it's amazing just for this generation. It's probably why they loved it so much. Is they they got the fruits of it. Um, no one and everyone else now isn't. They got the fruits of desire because they saw desire be created, and they got to have those desires. Where I guess now is we're so utterly engulfed in desire that we can see through them very quickly. I mean, you know, I often go on about younger generations now being, you know, a level of irony and depressiveness that takes years and years to develop in, you know. 30 year olds now is high school kids seem to be just insanely ironic and depressive to an extent you know they've already seen through it um at a, at a rate which seems you know astounding really um yeah so there's something there i think that being caught up in that initial anomaly of of desire and capitalism i mean i don't know yet what you'd make of that but 
<laughs> yeah, well, I think because I guess it's that's one thing that Mark does mention very briefly in lectures and doesn't quite get expanded upon, but I, which I, I do find really interesting as a thread is that I mean he does also talk about the 1930s a little bit, um, if only briefly. And he kind of talks about these 30 year cycles, mm -hmm. which just kind of line up in an really interesting way. Like you've got the 30s after the First World War, mm -hmm. and you get the 60s, and you get the 90s, um, <laughs> and then you kind of have where we are now. Um, and I guess what's interesting is that, you know, the 30s for at least for communism are really interesting for the, for the as far as leftist history goes. The 60s, mid counterculture, the 90s, mid rave culture. And then it's like, well, you know, as if we're going to follow this sort of K wave, I mean, I think he, he talks about Paul Mason in the first chapter. He's kind of has this big thing of K waves in capitalism. I mean, if we can talk about C waves or cultural waves, I don't know, that's awful coinage. But, um, uh, the, the, you know, where, where do you, the, there's there's something, you know, the, 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 this is, it seems to be how things go. And I guess it's maybe there's a case of plotting why that is, what and what that has to do with capitalism, especially, um, of that kind of, uh, yeah, that the, these, that, 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 that sort of progression that we seem to end up getting into, like, where we are now, I guess, sort of slightly frustrated and a bit sort of hitting a brick wall every 30 years, and then something's supposed to happen. And, I mean what's happened lately <laughs> it's kind mm. of the question i would say that by those sort of calculations throwing in my own understanding of the you know the kondriev wave cycles as i was talking to john michael gurr about it and people like him who were writing about like frugality and exiting exiting um society and uh you know that that niche Th thoreauian counterculture of um you know i don't know i don't know how you describe it but every 40 years there's people along on a lot like that come up so i mean <laughs> you put the leftism i don't know what what side of that the leftism would be and then you probably have another 10-year circle where you know it's like hyper capitalist so i it seems to me that we're entering into that with this is the next yeah. 10 years is going to be this like musky and you know on hyper online culture of people who just adore capitalism for its own sake without really i don't know you know these things happen i mean so i mean just to try, I guess, dig really deep into the lectures so we can sort of tackle them. I mean, I'll ask the the huge question, which is that Fish is trying to, I think, trying to tackle, which is, you know, the separation of desire and capitalism, basically. You know, is is that possible? And how, if so, how? Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, I mean, it is a big question. Um, and I guess what's so difficult about it is that... Um, it's not just a case of, can we imagine another kind of desire? But I think the problem for the left is that our thinking about capitalism is wholly wrapped up in that kind of thinking. Um, like, you, I mean, I, I kind of left it open on my desk in front of me because I, when I knew that we were going to talk about this and it's like, it's on the very first page of Capital. Marx talks about, the, the, the first thing he talks about is that how the, the commodity form relates to our wants. Like the whole the, the whole way, reason that capitalism arguably emerges and works is because we all want things. Mm -hmm. So society sets up a way of showing, well, if you want it, here's how you can go about it. That is related to you know labor power and whatever else. Or you know it's kind of the other way around where um, you know you, you have people that own the means of production. Uh, you have a, a labor force that doesn't. Or you know I guess in, we're talking feudal times. It's like you know that um, you, I own this land and you want to live here. Well, here's what you have to do to make that happen. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's fundamentally built on fulfilling desires. Um, and that's, I think, why it's such a difficult and knotted question for Mark in a lot of ways. And, and I mean, not just Mark, I mean, lots of people, because um, it, it, you start to get that contradiction of, well, you know, a lot of us now want something more than that. We don't just want to go to work. We want something, that, you know, a world beyond, we, we desire something beyond capitalism. And I think that that's kind of a contradiction for capitalism in itself. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's not just to say that this is the left talking about this. I think that's just the capitalism must be a system very aware that people want more than it necessarily, well, supposedly has to offer. And it's a question of how does, how does capitalism as a system end up providing more than that? Or does it, you know, necessitate the fact that capitalism is going to have to change into something else? Um, I think for Mark, and I think the sort of accelerationist point, maybe more broadly, is that well, you know, either we're going to have to change it to something else or capitalism is. Mm. Um, and desire is at the heart of that because that's precisely desire that's kind of driving any sort of mutation on either side, I think. And Marx probably of the uh, of the suggestion, of, of well, probably of the, yeah, has the, uh, shares the idea that 
um, uh, it's we that can change capitalism. Or rather, well, no, I guess this is the this is the catch twenty two. I kind of already don't agree with what I've just said, but but I guess that's the that I mean it's also the Marxist. Uh, well, and maybe also I guess we can come on to talking about it. We were talking about it maybe a little bit before we went live, but and I started recording the um, the kind of Landian catch twenty two that you have this like lands transcendental materialism. Um, no, mat Marx's materialism is that uh, well, I guess what do you say? Like Kant says that is an idealist so we can we we are we can have some influence over matter we can we can use I, if i know what I, I know i have an idea of tableness i can use that idea to change matter into a table but there's the gap that i'll never truly know what it is to be a table mm -hmm. so no matter how much mastery i have over an idea there's a gap between terms of what i can know about the material i guess for land the question is he sort of flips it and makes the, he takes Kant's point and applies it to Marx. Marx says it's not our ideas that change matter, but rather that matter or material conditions that change our ideas. Mm -hmm. And Mark, and, and Land just applies the same point, right? That like, well, that may be true, but there's still a transcendental gap there. You you don't you cannot fully know the material conditions that are informing your ideas, mm -hmm. which is far more terrifying than Kant's point, right? I guess that Kant, Kant's point is as an aesthetic point is quite humbling. But I can paint a picture and not fully understand that picture. It's like that's the sublime, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's kind of a beautiful. That, that's beauty in a way for him. Lance kind of makes it Lovecraftian, where no, there are things controlling you that you don't understand mm -hmm. and will never understand. Um, and I guess that's a huge. That's that's a huge influence on Marx thinking. Marx Marx PhD thesis is on Gothic materialism. Um, and I guess it's partly you know that that's the catch twenty two when it comes to desire and capitalism. Capitalism is driving our desires. The material conditions of now are influencing what we want, but we want something beyond those material conditions. And that's like I think it's that catch twenty two that's like so of, of such importance to both, I guess both the left left and right accelerationisms or, or, or both Land and, and and Fisher like the how you deal with that capture. It's kind of the, the most important question for them and also the biggest one. Um, and I guess it's not one that you can really answer <laughs> with any ease, but you know, you break it down in the chunks and you start to maybe get a better sense of, of how that, that works, how that process works and how we, what our place is within it. It's interesting, actually, when you, when you think about those, the, you know, the, the Kantian terminology in terms of that, that border between the idea and matter and you know your control over something there's always going to be an extent and you know under which it can be controlled and it actually brings me back makes me think of something you, i know you you used to write about a lot which is that concept of frontiers and you know when you think back to the western frontier those initial people who sort of controlled it loved it because they were controlling it but then the people who sort of had been born into it and been within it a few years found it an extremely violent place to live and i think actually when we think back to that 1950s era we see the same thing. There's a frontier there after World War II of this sort of, okay, we've we've almost got this weird reset where no one's got the resources or energy to do anything anymore. So we're, we, as a generation, you know, you had this reset where you could we could build something from it. And I think perhaps that's the reason why the hippies loved the 401k and that job so much is because they created it. You know, that was like, that would be amazing. That would be like a nice, comfortable life to have. So they had it. But then once you're, you've had that for you know, from the 70s through to the early 2000s, you've had that for 40 years. Once you've sort of been in it cycle upon cycle and it's finally stabilized, the, the frontier has been tamed, right? So, you, you you know, it's like there's no longer any to drag the metaphor out. There's no, no longer any more gold to mine in that sense of like a nine to five. So I think that's why we also see people trying to almost really, to, in a stressful degree now, find a new frontier whether it's like urbit with the online like we want the untamed internet back or mars uh, musk with mars like just any frontier and i think probably that's the appeal you know i've said it before but the appeal for like the ap apocalyptic and and the and the apoca ap apocalyptic narrative and also the adoration for like open world games and why so many people get consumed into them it's like you have a frontier that you can control and and i think that that's one of the problems with capitalism is like it says it's giving you frontiers, but they they they're so quick to sort of dissipate. You just think, no, there's you know, I have no control over this here. I mean, so that I think that same cycle is coming about again, and maybe it's a question of what's the frontier for acid communism. But that's the post, uh -huh. isn't it? That's the post 
capitalist thing. And I guess the the anomaly and why this is written about so much is, unlike other systems, as Land makes clear, capitalism always subsumes the post-capitalism into itself. There is no such thing as neo-capitalism. It's always just capitalism over and over again. So that that is, I guess, one of the anomalies we're dealing with in terms of how do we stop the frontier being subsumed back into the capitalist system? Yeah, it's it, it's something that I've ended up, I ended up reading. Um, I'm not sure how recent they are, but there's these series of lectures, these Al- Althusser lectures that I think Verso published on Rousseau. Um, I only I, I got it the other day. I'm not sure if the introduction, so like I probably shouldn't mention it. No, no grasp of it really. But it's, I mean, it's 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 really interesting reading where Althusser is kind of talking about. Um, I guess the, the the question for Rousseau and people of that era is like, how does society begin? And Rousseau, in our, and Rousseau, at least in Althusser's reading, is that he has this like um, it, he has this understanding of the void, the outside of society, like the, the forest, mm-hmm. where society obviously comes from. In in some sort of I guess maybe it's in some sort of fantasy sense. I mean, I guess it's not really anthropologically sound as an analysis. Yeah. So he's talking about the 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 void, uh, uh, and I guess it's. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it, 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 it feels very like Landian to me and, and also kind of Bajuian where he's like, he's the way that he's talking about it is that um, Althusser is kind of, I'm not going to be able to articulate it because it's kind of this really twisted argument, but he sort of says that when we try and figure out where things begin, mm-hmm. whether it's desire or society in general, or sort of speculatively, like where does communism begin? Um, to answer that question from w- w- within our present situation kind of doesn't doesn't necessarily involve going to an outside especially when there isn't one um or you kind of you end up fetishizing it as like you go and watch like you know some so, supposedly savage societies or uncivilized whatever we want to call it um you know we don't think like that anymore so we kind of end up going inwards you go to the inside where that kind of void lurks Rousseau talks about the heart right that it's not um that there is this sense within us that um this desire for that kind of, I mean, whether it's the womb in a kind of patriarchal sense or it is the forest, it's like this nature that we supposedly all come from. Um, and it's that kind of like that folding that Mark talks about a lot, especially in the Weird and the Eerie, that kind of the inside is a folding of the outside. Um, that, yeah, kind of as you say, like that, it's, it's, it's interesting reading how people talked about that before. Like this, these are lectures from the, the 60s, Russo's, what, like hundreds of years ago. And I mean, Lance has that series of essays, right, about the law of the void, like how we don't, we're not, so, we, we, or we weren't so interested, at least until Elon Musk came along, we weren't so interested in going to outer space anymore. Mm. Um, and I guess it's, it's yeah, it's, it's really interesting how that, um, but like the, the sort of terrifying, you follow that logic on the Althusser logic that you have to go inside to find the outside. Well, you do that with capitalism and you kind of end up going down this, well, the Landian route, like, or, or not even just the Landian route, but I guess it's also like, um, Rigori talks about it from a feminist angle. Lacan sort of similar in a way. Um, uh, it's all about like going. You affirm the process of alienation that is already like happening. Like you, you, you run in. You lean into being commodified. You, you lean into that kind of like at least on a subjective level. But how you do that politically in terms of frontiers? I guess it's like yeah, it's it's. It, it just comes back to that same catch twenty two again. That like you know, we we just we desire that beyond, but the beyond is always immediately captured by capitalism because it's like I don't know. It, it, whenever I, try, I, I kind of can follow it in my head, but as soon as I start talking about it, I feel like my just I just get my brain tied. Mm. Um, but I think that maybe it's maybe it's useful even to just mumble and fall over different references because it feels like it is the problem. Like there's probably something to be said that in not being able to articulate it, it, it betrays some sort of like, you haven't thought about it so much, but I think that's kind of, it's like a, a societal level. Like I think everybody ends up falling over this question because we just don't really know how to approach it because we, we if everything is sort of, you know, that global capitalism has left no stone unturned as it were. And the things that are left to be unturned, if they are there, are these things that, you know, are kind of horrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, I mean, I was, I was kind of reading that. I'm, I'm, you know, I think like I'm, I'm bringing up land because I was actually reading that, the, the, the Kant capital and prohibition of incest thing the other day, the lecture, I hadn't read it for ages. I just really enjoy, like, liked, I, I'd never quite like grasped the metaphor that he's using. And I think I'm also watching Game of Thrones again, which kind of also, there's so much incest in there. Um, 
I kind of got that weird the way the weird way he's using that as a metaphor like that we 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 capitalism is innately like at least capitalist thought or thinking under capitalism is innately incestuous there's no exogamy of thought where it's it's just it's literally just f- capitalism breeds with thing produced by capitalism and they have inbred capitalist thought babies mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they're all sort of mutant like I, I just never kind of grasped the grotesqueness of that idea but i guess that's partly where we're at right that's that's kind of the desiring thing too that's kind of partly also the problem like um i think at that point land still grasping onto there being some sort of feminist no well i mean it is feminist for him at that point but you know, the, some revolutionary subjects um and i guess that i think there's a very brassiest critique is that you can say that after this sort of so many years, land just doesn't see any sort of revolutionary subjects being possible anymore, mm. um, which is is kind of understandable. Um, I'm not sure I agree with it, but uh, I mean, that's probably just optimism. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I guess it's it's you know it's 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 how it's it, understanding how to break out of that incestuousness of just thinking is partly still where we're at. Like, but that's what is the outside in that sense like how it, it becomes but yeah i guess that's the kind of the point i'm trying to make it becomes a question for thought what is thought that's not been thought yet mm-hmm. um and that's just becomes it's it's yeah it's it's just like a black hole of headache inducing paradoxes well i think, I think we're seeing that playing out even in an empirical sense so what you just said there what is thought that hasn't been thought yet it's actually it's like one of my my favorite um land quotes from quite late in fang numenema so in fang numena so it's you know it's in the more experimental stuff where he says we're doing things before they make sense and that actually makes you know it makes me think of what you were saying that idea of like where's the new thought even if we have the new thought we don't really even we have no means to understand it because as you say we're in this weird strange incestuous relationship with that not to get too complicated but that marxist alien power is like doing its own thing and we're just and it makes me think of like you know, I mentioned it to someone the other day, the, the, back to this concept of frontiers and, and Musk and Mars. He, there's the frontier. Okay, we want to go there, but acid communism is saying, like, before we know there's this frontier, we know there's this void, but the thing we should do this time is know what we're going to do when we when we sort of capture it. And Musk it seems to be making the, the actual the same mistake because you read any of these articles or these news things about Musk, he's on about, like, we're going to get to Mars. And that's all he says. And one of them was like, literally came across i've said this to in another interview it came across as like we are going to get to mars even if it kills us right we just need to we just need to control the void we just need to get in there we just need to get to the frontier like there's been no real discussion about what we're going to do about the radiation on mars which will kill us in like you know minutes what we're going to you know how the hell are we going to live there like how are we going to live in the frontier how you know that's the same as sort of i guess in the in the uh, this is going to sound like a preschooler, but the, the cowboy era, sort of saying like, should we just go over there? But isn't the lines there? Yeah, but we should just go there and see. You know, they would have prepared. And I feel like that it's that same mistake again, whereas maybe acid communism is at least trying to remove itself from that trial and error process. It's saying like, okay, we're heading into the void. We, we know we're about to go into the abyss. Should we, you know, should we take some supplies? That's, yeah, my, well, I- that's my hammy metaphor. <laughs> no, it's it's a good one though because I think it's like um, I guess that's part of the uh, the other side. Of the problem though is that you know it's when we to understand what we're taking. I guess yeah, I think as communism is is that in a way, but it's it being critical of what we think we're taking with us. So we're not. It's not just like space imperialism. It's not just like extending the fallacy of like the Robinson Crusoe problem, right? You go to a desert island and you just rebuild the society you've left. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's the worst thing you could do. That's the stupidest thing you could do. I mean, that's what so I think Deleuze talks about that, right? Quite explicitly. Like the the Robin uh, and um, the Robin, yeah, um, it, yeah. Uh, well, no, it reminds me of the, the there's the Robinson Crusoe book, obviously, but there's um, I remember Robin Mackay talking about this once. I can never remember the name of the book. Um, uh, oh, was it called Friday or the Other Island? It was a, it was a, it was a kind of a, a parody of Robinson Crusoe that one of Deleuze's. Um, like best mates at school wrote while they were kind of in dialogue at their sort of early years. Deleuze is writing like desert islands and things. This guy writes this story about about Robinson Crusoe, well, Robinson going to an island and then like falling inside of it and being reborn as like this strange entity. It's a really good book. Um, but you know, it's it's like it's 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 it's, it's, it's an explicit concern from that era that it's you know you're not just you're not just conquering and then sticking your flag in like 
you take some supplies, but don't take a flag, I guess is partly it, right? You don't go and territorialize this, re territorialize Mars straight away. Like, and kind of embrace the void a bit. Take some supplies, but consider how living there is different to how we live here. Because that's the most radical thing about it, right? How how be how surviving on Mars necessitates another way of life is is the thing that should I, well I think should excite us about it. Um, and thinking about you know ourselves here um, because I guess it's that I remember we talked about Theroux before maybe on like a I think just over DMs or something. But like that's the thing that's always missed with him, right? It's not just that he went out to go and be away from everything. He kind of, he, he left the town to then come back to the town with a different perspective on it. And I feel like that's the thing, that should always be the thing with frontiers even, right? Like if you go to the frontier or you go past the frontier, it's always so you can look back and then con- you know, consider how the, the, the way of life you take for granted mm. isn't the only way of doing things. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the exhausting conversation. I'm sure you have it in terms of the acid communism framework, which is, you know, the, the, the Thoreau one in a way is, is, oh, well, you know, people, people were critical of him because, oh, well, no, we can't all live like that. And when you say to people like, you know, about, um, four day work weeks or less than eight hour work days or whatever, there's the instant thing is always, yeah, but, and it's like, you know, it's crab bucket mentality, but capitalism really has that down, which actually <laughs> that, that whole Thoreau idea that, which basically I would, I would argue most people are critical of in, in abstract that idea that like you you exit the the accepted collective society or collective system and then you go away and you do your own thing and then you come back and you can have that comparison and say well hang on you know when I was out there it you know it removed me from that incestuous relationship that you're on about it removed me from that just enough to say well you know I can look at it this way now and people are very quick to drag themselves back in because there's sort of a comfort there. What well, actually brings me, you know, through to that, the the final lecture, I think it's the final lecture or it might be the fourth one, where Fish is talking about Lyotard and the Biddle economy. And of course, like, you know, the, the, the quote is taken the mick out of quite a bit now, the, the famous um, hang on tight, spit on me, where Lyotard um, basically in short just says that the working class enjoy the misery of, the, the factory which i guess in leotard's day would have been sort of a probably like a 10 hour day six days a week in a, in a manufacturing factory and he's saying actually the fact that we we just compulsively have this repetitive habit where we almost defend that you know so you know we we, we hold that sort of protestant work ethic in in regard you know you hear a lot of people still say oh he's got good i've got i've got a great work ethic oh come on you know, they, I just think that's the most left, right, whatever. I think it's the most pathetic thing I've ever heard, especially unless it's about a passion project. But when you hear someone like in a retail job, for instance, oh, I've got a great work ethic. Have you? That's good to hear. You know, and that's when I can sympathize with Leotard, though. When, yeah, because, it's, it's because like I'm a great bootlicker. Yeah, like, but no, because kind of what's the definition of work there? It's like, you know, it is. It's like, it's almost like saying I have a great ethic for you know bowing at the altar of capital right it's like i've given more i've given more of my flesh over in a way i've cut more of myself off to give to capitalism and i think that's why it's so absurd and i can sympathize with leotard because i've met so i have met so many people who but it's not them it's not i I would just argue it's not them who is saying that it's the the possessor it's the alien force which is saying um so yeah but i mean what's what is fish's relationship with this with this this idea um, I mean, it's yeah, it's. It, 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 I mean, it's, you, you're right. It, it, it's the last lecture is on this book, and in a way, that's kind of what makes it such a difficult question to answer because it's like he discusses the text, and then we never get to kind of hear how it relates to what is to come. But I think it's it is kind of like it's the heart of it in a way. Um, it, you know, I guess that the, 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 the Leotard's provocation sounds like he's saying, you know, we desire our own misery. Why do we desire our own misery? I mean, that's kind of the question that I guess, um, in a way, he's kind of adding a further layer to that provocation, where I guess that that's a question that Nietzsche's asked, that Deleuze and Guattari also ask. And I guess the problem for Leotard is that it's like, well, it's all well and good you asking that question because you're not the one doing any of the work. Hmm. Like, you know, what is it to, you, what, what, what you see as misery? I guess it's that same thing, right? It's like it's 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 it's, it's recognizing the difference between those two positions. What is it to um, 
it's, it's kind of go well i mean it's, it's a question of going beyond the pleasure principle probably in, in maybe one of the, the simplest way it's like what is it about capitalism that is able to transform suffering into pleasure or or what is it you know that and and, and but what kind of like understanding do you need to have to understand that suffering as suffering in the first place because that's kind of like the move that's going on right it's like you, we can talk about how shit capitalism is from our sort of you know theoretically I was going to, not from our ivory towers i mean we're on zoom with cameras so i don't think either of us look like we're in ivory towers that would be nice um but you know but i guess it's the the, the, the point is more like you know the, um there's a certain level of like consciousness rising that's involved in understanding your own life as being shit and maybe people don't want to do that mm. like maybe you don't want to have a critical outlook on what you do every day that will just make you more miserable like why not you know just affirm the life that you have and that's i think in in lots of ways that's perfectly understandable um um but i guess that, that but that you know that that initially immediately poses a problem for um anti-capitalists you know how do you, how do you how do you intervene in that kind of like consciousness um that kind of a not like the you know, i was gonna say normative is probably the wrong word to use but that kind of like you know the the, the, the the common sense capitalist view um without you know portraying yourself as like the doom bringer who's just gonna you know bring about a life of doom scrolling which are kind of i guess a lot of us already possess anyway um at least in the sort of our circles that are we're just talking about how shit life is <laughs> um but i mean anyway i guess the layers here, it kind of goes back to the very first lecture that Mark's talking about, where he he, he uses as an example um, Louise Mench's appearance on the sort of British panel show, Have I Got News For You, around the time of Occupy. And I think Louise Mench is, people that don't know, she's like a Conservative MP, or was a Conservative MP. She's also formerly like a chick-lit chick -lit author. Um, I guess that's what it was, anyway, that's what it was described at the time. I kind of don't want to be derogatory about whatever someone else chooses to write, but um, she has this whole thing where it's like these, these protesters, supposed anti-capitalists, are tweeting about the protests from their iPhones and they're in line for Starbucks. Like, how can they, how can they protest capitalism whilst using all of the fruits of, that, it, that it brings to us? And she gets ridiculed for sort of saying that, like, all, is all capitalism bringing us iPhones and coffee? Like, surely it's more than that to it. But um, I guess that it, what, what, what that, her point starts to resemble is that like just ubiquitous meme where you have that like peasant with like twigs on his back being like oh we should improve society whatnot and then the reply guy out of a well that's like oh but yet you participated in society how curious and i guess it's like pointing out that tradition tells us nothing and we kind of know that and i think leotard knows that leotard's kind of pointing at that meme he's sort of being that person for the 70s and it's like um, you know, when when Deleuze and Guattari and Nietzsche sort of say that, they're 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 the people that are being like, yeah, you participate in society, or or you know, maybe you should think this more. Like it's like, well, who are you? That's that's who you look like. You look like the little well dweller, <laughs> and no one likes you. <laughs> Leotard's sort of the person saying that. And I think it's that's it's 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 it's, it's interesting because it's like that raises so many more questions about our the role of philosophy in 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 bringing about anti-capitalist societies, bringing about post-capitalist society. Um, and I think maybe one of the ways that I always think about it now is like in terms of social media, um, it, it kind of, it, it relates back to that problem of frontiers. Um, like I guess yeah, you mentioned sort of like the more, the more, the more, the, the anarchist version of the, of the internet that people kind of are harking back for in a way, but seems like an impossibility. Like we have to kind of, just claw out certain enclaves. And I think people, a lot of people are doing that, but it's it's a way of like how you actually navigate that space. Like, um, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I know we, we, we both hate social media, but are actively participating in social media. <laughs> I've been called out for this so many times, so many times lately. So, someone referred to me and they said, I wish Meta Nomad would shut up about leaving Twitter and just log off. <laughs> Which, like, I can't even be mad, but there's this, there's, I don't know, there's this point of, like, uh, to a certain degree, it's, like, this masochistic addiction. And everyone on Twitter is, like, in agreement with this now. They say, like, this, why, this is so shit and annoying. Why, why do I do this to myself every day? But equally, it's where everyone is, right? So it's almost like the same leotard thing of saying, like, 
God, this factory is so awful and shit, but all my mates are here, right? And everyone, exactly. has, and everyone has to do this. It's the only way without doing like the Ted Kaczynski thing of going mad and just like, you know, just not, it's like the equivalent of saying like, do you have an email address or a phone? You know, it's like, there's, there's just a degree, but, but uh, of you need these things need, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's difficult to, to explain, well, why do I do this? It's, it's the, capitalism problem in micro form why do i do this exactly thing? why yeah. do i do this thing to myself which consistently is basically frying my attention span making me annoyed and 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 i, I rarely get anything out of it and i but i think because it's almost an accelerator an accelerationist argument on a social level though that i have to push through the dreadful struggle of this site to just the the few moments where there might be a possibility of drawing out something from it which is worth retrieving you know and you know i to a certain degree i would say oh i don't want mass popularity and status but i still do do these things because i think well i've got something to say and people like to read it so you know i'm not going to deny that so there is a degree that i would want my stuff you know the work i do read and seen so you know but there is you know, is the, the society problem here well yeah i think i mean that's exactly what i was going to say is that it is it literally is capitalism in microcosm but I think that that's what's interesting about it is that like that's the way that we talk about it and we kind of say it self-deprecatingly. Like if you know if, if we're going to be honest, I hate Twitter, but it's nice when I tweet something and it gets lots of retweets and likes. That yeah. that feels quite nice. What is that if not a libidinal economy? Like like that that is literally me. I I desire this this minor experience, this this one saving grace that is um, the, the 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 positivity of doing something that people like. And I mean, I think I mean I don't think there's any shame in in, in wanting to be read. I feel like especially if we're dealing with politics that's the end goal uh, fundamentally like the only way we're going to share ideas and promote them is by being read so i think you know i, I personally I, I don't take any shame in being a self-promoter on twitter because that's that's all it's for really mm -hmm. is, at the end of the day um but i guess it's partly you know that that is that is complicated by that sort of the the the, the, the how shit it is for mental health overall <laughs> And also how it can be like the one thing that makes your day every once in a while. And and I think that is that is literally the problem we're faced with more generally when it comes with work. Like get, getting getting the promotion feels really good that you've kind of been recognized for what you do. Does that and somehow, I mean, not, not I've never been promoted, so I can't really talk from experience, but I imagine that that's the thing that like makes the otherwise shit like complaining and bitching with your colleagues in the pub afterwards that kind of makes it feel worthwhile like that one moment where you maybe get like a beer <laughs> bought for you by your boss oh, somehow overrides the rest of the shit that's and like that's fundamentally the problem that we're in that's what leotard's talking about i think that's so bleak i imagine <laughs> i imagine it? being it? i imagine being good at a job feels good <laughs> 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 I didn't, I didn't know that's what you meant but that is bleak but it is it's, so true like the, it's so like true the fantasy that but when you bring it down to that objective level a lot of fantasies out there are like god man i wish i was good at this thing that i don't really enjoy that much <laughs> that's, that's oh. dreadful. but i remember no, yeah. but i felt that way when i was in retail for a long time it was like this is fine because i've got a holiday coming up or like some yeah. days i don't have to do the bad job here it's like ah, oh, man you know, and like I, I, I enjoyed it the most when I was on bakery shift because the early hours went faster, and it's like that, and that's why I didn't at the time. I didn't really have a dream of much else because it's just after uni that weird, like zero zone of space you're in after uni for a while. And it's like that was the desire, like just get by for a while. So you know, but I, I'm not sure. I think Leotard probably pushes that to an uh, extreme because I'm not sure there's a desire for oh, yeah, misery, totally. but I think there's a comfort in the misery because in those bounds there is like, I don't know that you know you do everything you're you're told, and I think certain people are shocked out of that. You know, you notice people have had serious shocks, but then they almost go too far. Um, you know, and like, you know, almost like that film Falling Down, um, where he's just in a traffic jam one day and just cracks and goes and like shoots people up and stuff and it's like yeah but you, you don't have to you don't have to go that that far like there's an in-between we can go like maybe i just won't do this like okay I'm, I'm done right um but you know every time we've had a chat and this isn't like a critique it's like we are always tackling this unanswerable bind yeah um but i think the best <laughs> the best thing you can do is really just 
just talk about it really because what you know it's these same pro- these same problems like how do you remove desire from capitalism and how do you you know is is post capitalism a thing I think I feel I like think we're getting somewhere like, though I feel like over oh, no, this three years span we've got somewhere <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yeah um, well I remember I, I specifically remember having when we last had this conversation and I I, I mean I I, I dare not what listen back to that first episode I'd probably be deeply embarrassed by all the things that I was saying but I kind of do remember where we where I think I, you were asking this question about post work and I was trying to like argue the case for what work is when it's not like beyond capitalism which i think is a really it's a, it's a really genuine question and i think the answer that i gave is probably a bit shit but it's kind of like now three years on i kind of feel like I, I don't really have a better answer but i feel like i understand the problem at a deeper level and i guess that like i mean one thing i was going to say at least at least in terms of like we talk about jobs and why we do that i guess the one thing is that that's kind of where it comes in with this well it kind of brings me back to russo in this this, these are Altizer lectures where, it, and, and it's kind of a problem that we have, not just in terms of work, but I mean, you can sort of say it with psychoanalysis, like we always go back to this primal scene that with the beginning, where did these things come from? Um, and I guess that I think the, the, one, the way that Rousseau R- R- approaches it, at least in his sense of the social contract, um, like that is the beginning. Like if we, if we, when we understand that we have desires, so everyone's not just taking what they want all the time you have to sort of set up these certain boundaries and that becomes a social contract but then the issue is i think with capitalism this capitalism relies on the social contract a very complex social contract especially when you're at work so the idea that being that like you um you you go to work because your boss is then obliged to give you rent or and, and give you a certain you know you, maybe you if you live in america you get insurance from that you get like these certain perks mm-hmm. from being employed uh, but then the kind of the problem comes that and this is kind of i guess where you get things like trade unions popping up and, the, and, the, and it's kind of a, the, the brilliant the the, the 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 kind of amazing thing about the, the existence of trade unions which i kind of didn't realize until like well, i think it was also reading altizer i'm in a big altizer kick and uh, it's probably gonna come across now but he has this whole thing about why trade unions exist in his book on the reproduction of capital where he's like trade unions are kind of genius because they are there to make sure the social contract is being implemented mm-hmm. and is being you know the, what 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 is being what, what, even just the, the the actual literal contract you sign at work that that contract is being met by your employer but what trade unions also kind of do is they raise consciousness amongst the workers because their very existence and the way they do illuminates how reluctant employers are to fulfill their side of the contract mm-hmm. and it's like that I think that's kind of an interesting first step where when you start to realize that we we do, the reason why we 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 feel this way about work about like chase out that glib of a <laughs> glib or glim glimmer of of of, of a serotonin <laughs> um, in in your sort of like your your three year career mm. you you search for that one good day it's a uh, precisely three year career oh, i'm just I'm, <laughs> I'm just now i feel like i feel like i'm i'm inadvertently like showing up my own awful job history <laughs> just <laughs> got very low barriers on what a career is every, every day. <laughs> no, no, no. um i'm the same the longest job i've ever had is two years so like but no it's me too. well yeah well, i think i think i did manage to break two years i think it was really i uh, hated that job anyway um but you know that i guess that's you know it's 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 it starts that that just further illuminates that you know the, the, the reason why we have a social contract but half people that, that draw up those contracts are so reluctant in themselves to fulfill them and to maintain them that starts to you know that that kind of brings the question together these questions of the void like you know if well if 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 we hate going to work and employers hate employing people anyway. Like, you know, why, why, why can't we think about how we could organize things differently? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of it's kind of levering open that space, um, like kind of on both sides, which is kind of what's interesting. Um, uh, you know, the, the, we can say that, that there, you know, the, the, the automation's kind of thrown up as this thing that um, is, is, is probably gonna make jobs suffer. We're gonna, they're gonna reduce the number of jobs available. But, you know, is there not what we can turn that into being a good thing? Um, that we have, we, we, we could probably work less, um, but we don't have the infrastructure for allowing that. Like there's, there's all these things, especially during the pandemic, that are raising the question that the things, the way that things are organized aren't really fit for purpose. In, and especially not in all scenarios. There are, there, there, are, there are so many contingencies where things could be done differently, but we deny ourselves that. And I guess it's a question of why. 
And I think Leotard's kind of, it, it, that's kind of what Leotard's talking about in a way. It's like he's, but yeah, I mean, taking it to an extreme for sure, but kind of because the depths, I guess what I'm trying to say is the depths of the problem are that extreme. You start off talking about social media and suddenly you're talking about the social contract. And it's like, the, I mean, social media and social contract probably aren't, don't feel that too far away, but in terms of history of thought, that that you know that that it's it's a it's a huge history of, of 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 mutating ideas that covers such a vast space of time, and it's the same problem in a way going back hundreds of years. Um, and what is it? Is it because the problem is just difficult, or is it just that we're stubborn in actually the ways that we could the the other potential ways there are that we could deal with it? And I personally think it's the latter. You know, I would agree because it mentioned it makes me think of. Um... Rene Girard's concept of of the scapegoat, and he he his form formation formulation is that um, the social contract is actually basically dependent on this idea of a scapegoat of this like one thing which everyone collectively says like no that's you know we need to get around that and we develop from that and, you know and it makes me you know makes me think of social media and this idea that almost like a reverse parasitic scapegoat that gets in you like if there's just this one thing then I'll leave or like if just this yeah. one thing changes in my job then it'll be fine. Right. If we could just get this, then it would be fine. But it's underlying that whole assumption is like, but what is the whole thing which makes you constantly change that scapegoat? Like, if I just get to the weekend, that's fine. And the whole job revolves around like one little node of, you know, everyone just clinging to something instead of going like, let's step back and assess that whole mentality of what it is to feel like you have to just cling to something just to keep going. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, that makes me also think of, you know, you're talking about post-work and what it is to work and like that. Um, and I think every, everyone has this, but it's that parasitic relationship with capitalism. Like I was going to, I was thinking about buying a 3D printer soon. They're like really affordable now. And I was thinking, oh, this would be cool. I could just make all this stuff. And then my mind just goes to that place. You go, oh yeah, you can make that and sell it. Like, no, why can't I just, why can't I just make something? Why can't I just make mm. something? And I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. There's like a parasitic scapegoat that everything needs to be economized, or at least even if I have no intention of selling it, there is like a possibility for that. Um, and that, I think that's where you find some power in a way in society is having that um, comfort to be like, you know, what, what, what do you do? Like, oh, I grow moss. Why? Because I like to grow moss. You know, like, and that is so, you know, that's outside of that um incestuous relationship we're on about and i think when you see things that are outside of it they're so glaringly outside of it that they just they're just so we they're weird right like you know what are you doing today i'm just gonna walk like you know or something like that you know it's it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense because our idea of what it is to reason and make sense is still within that relationship so but i'm rambling you know <laughs> yeah. so yeah well, no but it's, it, but it's really important because it is it's fundamentally related to what we both do right i guess like we both <laughs> I, 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 as soon as you talk about that, I just think about like blogging. Well, the whole reason I end up blogging, I, I always end up, I've blogged for years and I kind of, I, I migrated my archive over to xenogothic.com the other day, going back like to 2008. And it, it was kind of created to just do that because it was like, I've been doing this in some form for so long, for probably almost half my life. I'm nearly 30. I've got 12 years of blogging under my belt. That's kind of insane. And it, it's not something that I do and I've ever sort of done with the expectation of being paid. Mm. But the times when I've quit blogging or stopped blogging, it's always been because I've come to the realization that this isn't, I'm not, like, this is what I do and this is what I feel like I'm good at. It's completely unvalued and no one gives a shit about it. And it's like, well, how, like, how can I live my best life and also like live? And that's mm. like, so it's, it's changing now. Like I'm, I'm amazed, I'm so grateful for like having like platforms like Patreon and things like that, where the people that appreciate what you do can, you know, support you for it and have that sort of solidarity is really important but they're not ideal no. um and they also are all a bit weird and i don't know but but it's like those are the sorts of questions that like and i feel like it's maybe it's maybe in a way it's generational like i think th th that's kind of what's changed with social media in a way like you, i mean you, i remember when instagram when instagram first started everyone was talking about it because i mean i was doing a photography degree and as a photographer, I was talking about the here's a social media platform just for us. Isn't this wicked? Let's just like go on there and share things. And now it's like people are making so much money off of Instagram for doing things that like we never would have thought to do with it. And not in a good way. <laughs> like, mm. I don't know, just like, you know, girls in bikinis holding perfume bottles. Like that's, and that's like making like 20 grand from a post. And that's 
I mean, good for you if like you've got the capacity to do that. But um, you know, it's it's so far away from what we thought it would be used for. Um, and especially with something like photography that kind of becomes this, in a way, abstracted labor mm. um, in the sense that it's, we, we're always looking at images, but photography is like one of the hardest things to make a living off of, unless you just totally sell your soul. And like, it just become, you, you, you lean into the kind of being a marketer for other people, but as an art form, it's completely destitute. And writing kind of feels like the same thing, but even worse, like no one cares about writing anymore. You have to do like a podcast and that's great. And I think podcasts are wicked. I think doing video essays is wicked, but like, it's so, it makes, it's just, it just makes it so hard to actually do what you think has value in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of why I kind of think, I mean, sorry, I'm also now rambling, but I guess I'm, I'm, like, the point is that I can, I kind of feel like that's why it's, obviously important to us both right because it does it it's it's a it's a big philosophical question but i feel like we kind of i almost feel like at the, you know we're kind of at the heart of it in terms of what we do day to day mm -hmm. well it's interesting you mentioned about instagram because i think that's almost happened with every thinking about it right now almost happened with every social media i mean when i look at twitter it's the one that's meant to connect you with tons and tons of like the most strangers you know literally followers and actually everyone on there at the moment seems to want to get away from that in some sense and facebook's turned into basically a really weird marketplace of something and actually what you know the one thing i would mention just combining these two things you know this what we're talking about now with this strange form of value and this notion of work it's like uh, i mentioned this in another interview recently but i watch twitch now i just scroll through and see what's going on just I, it's my like window into the world and i posted the just the image of it the other day a news article where um someone who makes their money from role playing in gta online they quit because it was too much like a real job and I, so i've been watching these gta role play streams and it's not like they're role playing criminals or like oh yeah man i'm a cool stunt man or like people are role playing retail jobs on a daily basis right they're they're going online and thousands of people are watching right so get th get this i sound like a like a really bad 4am bbc radio <laughs> but people are literally going online like daily so thousands of people are watching someone else role play a retail worker in a game and nothing really exciting is happening there so for me there is in that somewhere is a node of something which i think is really important you know basically and if someone could work out the epistemology of that okay why why do we want that why do we, why do we want that <laughs> I, I can't work it out and I, you know i think but i think for some reason that just seems really key to this whole thing is whatever the hell's going on on twitch <laughs> i guess maybe maybe that's part of that same thing right like where you mean you go to work because that's where your friends are like you there is opportunity to play at work Mm -hmm. But then Twitch makes that all too literal, where you are literally playing at work. <laughs> Which I mean, it kind of in that sense, it make it, in in that sense, it makes sense. If that makes sense, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's so fucked. <laughs> it is. It is. But it's it's. I think it's as fucked as people who are constantly listen. You know, they're they're about to eat a meal and they'll put a podcast on or because. I just, you know, there's a compulsion, like, I need to be part of something constantly. So people are always, you know, listening to something or watching something. Um, and it's just got to the extent of of complete, you know, I, I use this word loads now because I just think it's funny, but it's Ballardian. It's Ballardian nightmare. Yeah. It, it is, I can't, you know, it's the most cringy word, but I think it's funny. But, you know, he was spot on. And we live in his world. We totally do. Oh, yeah. Which is horrifying, really. But. Mm. Mm. Because it wasn't a fun world to be in most of the time. I mean, well, but again, it was. <laughs> that's the, it's kind of, it's that's part of the whole thing, right? It's, it, it's that sort of, it's that strange, not like Freud talks about beyond the pleasure principle. Ballard talks about like smashing through the pleasure principle in your like, in your like, whatever, Bentley. <laughs> like, I'm trying to think, I'm, I've completely forgotten the plot of Crash in my head, but it came to mind. But um, you no, know, it kind of, it's, it literally is like finding sexual gratification in a car crash is is like the most extreme metaphor for like our lives like the my my car crash life is sexually gratifying in some weird way like fetishized online which i mean i mean not mine personally but I, you can think of plenty of people that are sort of turn that into an only fans where you just talk yeah. about oh, like, 
I wonder what that that happens to you. I wonder what that drive is then, because obviously you have the death drive, you know, the compulsion for destruction and to basically for death. And then you have, you know, before that, sex drives. I mean, what what is the the, the contemporary Balladian drive? I mean, you could say maybe a drive for entertainment. Is it just a, a drive to be uh, to be to to be acknowledged? Well, the, the, the Lacanian, acknowledged drive. Lacanian death drives, like. I, I, I really like Lacan on this because Lacan mm-hmm. says every di- drive is a death drive because mm-hmm. every every drive desires its own ex its own ex- ex- extinction extinguishment. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. what the word is there, um, but obviously when you extinguish a drive, you don't have it anymore. So you kind of have that repetition compulsion where you kind of you get to the point you get to the point just before death, and then you go back to the start again. Like that's the and I kind of feel like that's in a way I feel like that's what that is what Ballard puts on steroids. It's like this Lacanian version where we will, every desire wants to be extinguished, but when every every when every drive is a death drive, then I mean that truism just kind of homogenizes them all, right? When it, if it, you can kind of revert them back to every every drive is is a desire for death, <laughs> like even like it, it's it's all kind of nihilistic all the way down at that point in a way like it kind of the freudian and lacanian understandings of the death drive just eat themselves i kind of feel like um where yeah everything is just everything that we do becomes just an attempt to end it all to end to end the the mundanity of whatever is the this this life this capitalist life wow it's a lovely point to end on mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you see, you kicked back in your chair, ruminating on that side with a grin <laughs> on your face, like, ah, yes, <laughs> death drives all the way down. No, I was actually imagining thinking back to like if this was a radio show and like someone coming back from a horrible <laughs> four a.m. shift and like a security car job, and just driving their car slowly off the road. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds oh, like something that would be yeah. part of an Alan Partridge skit, and he'd go, oh yes. Anyway, you know, and just sort of transition into the next thing. But I think this has happened this every time. This would be amazing if it was broadcast on Radio Norwich. That would yeah. be amazing. I think every time we've spoken, though, we've sort of ended up, we, you know, like I said, we always end up in this this bind, ending something. I, you know, but it made me think, actually, you know, going back to the almost that like GTA, GTA role plays, like, as a society, this is almost something like the Joker would say. As a society, we've, re- <laughs> we've, re- we've reached, like, the end game of a video game, right? You, you, you've skilled up everything. You've leveled up. You've done every all the potential and possibility and and trinkets and rewards are so easily gratifiable by capitalism we've now accelerated it to the point where we can see through them before we've even attained them you know and this is something um todd mcgowan talks about he says like if you want to deny capitalism deny that your desire is even going to be fulfilled before you even do it so it's like Mm. oh i don't even you know you know that porsche like yeah i desire it but i know already that it's not going to fulfill me and by doing that you sort of like short circuit it and i think we already have that even from a young age now it's like we know like even if we you know you see people like dan bilzerian who's supposedly got every single you know level up in the game of capitalism and yet something there is still substantially missing and so we sort of you're caught in this thing where you still it's like playing a game you're just not enjoying anymore but you have to yeah. play you're just grinding <laughs> Grinding those, <laughs> grinding those points. <laughs> it's bleak. So, so but I mean, that's yeah. that's like it too. Like I guess that's because I don't. I mean, this is probably just a, 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 an adage that won't go anywhere. But I know people do talk about that a lot with the gamification of capitalism, and it is like it, I think that's a conversation that's been going around for a while. But when you see it at that level, when it is literally, I mean, it's because it, I guess that's it. When you talk about the, like that short circuiting, if you, you think about that desire like a, a snake chasing its own tail, I just always think of it like that. The, there's no when you have that sort of diagram, there's a hole in the middle. It's a donut snake, and it's mm-hmm. like we, the, the snake has eaten so much of itself that it's just it's just this like little nub that just rolled <laughs> away. Like that's that's kind of where we're at. Mm-hmm. We're at the point where, and, and at that point, you kind of know that there's nothing else to eat. Like it's still you're still in that in that process, but th- there's not a lot of give left. We just we're just like a little nugget snake that's like <laughs> totally like ingrown and it's just rolling about now. And I guess when you see it like that, it's it makes it easier to feel like you can break out of it. And I feel like we are at that sort of point where I mean we've been there for a while. It feels like something has got to give. Yeah, but it's just a question of what and when. And I guess it's uh, at least I think for me it's a, I always I think of it more now as just being a case of like being ready for it. 
like I think, and I think I've been reading. I think it's it's out. It's out to air. It's also like Lenin. Like a lot of these sort of twentieth century Marxist thinkers get to the point of thinking like, you know, we we know that revolutions fail more often because it's like it's just it's just not being in the right place at the right time. But so you can go through whatever, and you, you know, go through failures, and you know that you will learn from them. And when the right opportunity comes along, at least you'll be prepared for it. I kind of feel like that's the, the 2008 thing with the financial crash. That was probably an amazing opportunity for the left and it bottled it because it wasn't prepared for what was coming. And I guess I feel like that's where we're at now. I mean, Corbyn's kind of a similar point. It's like, well, no, we were the left in the UK at least was ready for it. There was the, 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 the US had Bernie and it wasn't quite ready to go with it. But I mean, I mean like the UK, we, we got the left in the UK got to a certain point of being like, we're, we're, we've, we've picked a horse and we're going to try and ride to the end, but it wasn't enough. And I feel like that's like an important lesson. It's like, well, you know, there's you, <laughs> you need to be even better prepared than just picking the right horse in a certain race. Like it's 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 a far longer game than that. Um, and I think that's I mean that, that's I mean I'm talking about the left because I'm biased, but I feel like that's true of any sort of political project. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You can say that the right was there with Trump, like yeah, that was yeah. the that was the right horse to back at the right time. But wasn't enough. Just you like need, yeah. You, oh, you needed a new horse, right? Like the so the circumstances and the conditions changed. You you've got to be you know if you can't adapt and you can't adapt to the two, the changing material conditions. The you know the, because I guess that's the tangent that materialism thing, right? The, the material the, those conditions are always changing, um, uh, and we cannot fully access. You know we can't predict what is going to happen next, but we can at least. You know, be prepared. We can we can keep our options open and, and be prepared enough to respond in whatever way is necessary. Okay, I think that is a positive note. That is a positive. Maybe that's yeah, <laughs> there you go. Where about um? So this is Repeater, isn't it? This uh, book was published with Repeater books. So obviously, it can be found on their site, and I'm assuming it's on Amazon and and all the other places, yeah, which are also places. owned by Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, for being honest, a books that's always best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. buy it from repeater books if you want to buy it because that's always the best place to get those things yeah. straight from the yeah press. Cool, cool. And what are you, are you working on? Anything at the moment? Anything big, new? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I know that we, we, we worked on our accelerations and course together last year. I'm, I'm trying to turn my half into a book, I've still been working on it and I'm trying to like extend it out and I'm just continuing that research. Um, so I'm hoping that that'll. I'll have like a a final draft for that maybe end of the year. That's basically what my time is taking up at the moment. So working on that question, um, which I'm very grateful for you for instigating. Actually, you probably wouldn't. <laughs> you're gonna have to you're gonna have to put you at the top of the acknowledgements that it wouldn't exist without you uh, inviting us to do that thing. Which I guess we can say is still an offer. Um, yeah, still there. Still there. So, uh, still people like sort of signing up and stuff. So you know, it's still popular. Um, yeah, cool. And. Uh, yeah, and your other book's doing quite well as well, I hear. Um, yeah, Egress came, uh, Egress came out nearly a year ago now. Um, yeah, that's still available. Um, because we were just saying before we went live, that um, I keep saying live, I've been doing too many like YouTube chats around this book. Um, it's before we started recording. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's strange that, to think that that came out a year ago, but I think it's probably better suited to now. There was a sense that the, the moment for that book was going to go. And it would be gone and we kind of and i'm still really proud of it and i wouldn't change anything in it really um but i think it was maybe premature it's better to i think the, the reading the after these lectures maybe makes more sense if people get sad that these lectures end quite abruptly which they do um egress kind of carries on the story at least from my perspective so check it out <laughs> okay man um yeah i think that's a good place to sort of finish up um sorry listeners that we've answered no questions um <laughs> But yeah, Matt, thanks for thanks for coming on again. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to chat to you.